We're here today um, looking at the impact and the very positive effect that women have had in the civil justice and trade union movements. Very often women are forgotten about in those movements, so today is really important to remind us about a lot of our history. We're hoping that at the end of this meeting, what will come of it is that community groups and trade unions will link together and projects that they share and it won't just be about employment it'll be what's happening in the community about poverty might be about growing food developing interaction but also that important link where we influence our politicians i've just come away from an absolutely excellent event uh, in the center of manchester put on by the Greater Manchester Association of Trade Union Councils uh, and it was called um, Women Shaping Trade Union and Civil Justice Movements. Um, I had the opportunity to talk a little bit about my own trade union journey uh, and barriers that were perhaps put in my way um, that wouldn't necessarily be there for, for other people um, but also how we move forward really how we how we organize and how we how we take it forward how we work towards progressive platforming getting more women involved debunking some of the the language that we use in the trade union labor movement and it was just a really progressive event and a really real feel-good experience um, unfortunately I couldn't stay for the whole thing um, but it was a, a really brilliant event please give them a follow uh, on Twitter and get yourself to the next one cheers Uh, I'm uh, now going to hand over to Barbara Bentham. Uh, Barbara uh, works uh, for the Salford Unemployment Centre. She, uh, she's a welfare rights uh, appeals worker um, and she uh, helps people who have been uh, unfairly penalised by what is already an unfair system. Uh, she's, also a, she's also a local councillor and she, uh, she currently is the lead for environment, neighbourhoods and community safety, which sounds very grand and I look forward to hearing all about it, Barbara. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. I'm Barbara Bentham and I'm a working class single parent from Salford. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not one of those people most fortunate people who've always known what career path they were going to take. In fact, I'm still not sure I know what I want to be when I grow up. But had someone told 16-year-old me that I would end up an elected politician, I would have assumed that they'd taken something. So I didn't set out to be a welfare rights officer or a politician. And I certainly wouldn't have been the latter had I not been the former. So I wanted to start by sharing how my fight for justice and equality has moulded my life. I began my career with Transport and General Workers Union after leaving school at 16. I was employed as an office junior in the union's regional office in Salford. My decision to take this job has helped shape me into the person that I am today. I realised very quickly how fortunate I was to have a decent employer who genuinely cared about its workforce, whilst learning that for most people, this wasn't the case. I learned that life is unfair and people are often exploited, with employers often putting their own greed above the worker's need. Employers would rather pay thousands in legal fees to save them from paying decent wages. Health and safety was often a secondary consideration to company profits and no consideration was given to the welfare of the workforce. I saw daily horror stories such as bar staff dismissed for refusing to pick up dead rats, machine operators losing limbs as they were encouraged to remove safety features to increase productivity, and union reps victimised from trying to stop these things from happening. I hated seeing this injustice and I wanted to make a difference. I was elected as shop steward by the time I was 19 and then I was quickly elected to be the national staff rep that represented the Northwest region. As a union rep, I became even more aware of how uneven the system was and it fueled my passion to want to give the members that I represented the best chances of success. My aim at this time was to represent members in tribunals. So supported by the union and through their education programme, I returned to education, studying law and psychology. 
Working for a trade union under a Thatcher-led Conservative government was an education in itself, with numerous anti-trade union laws being passed, trying to erode workers' access to support and representation, attacking the union's finances and workers' rights. In 1980, the Conservative government passed the Employment Act, which restricted unions' powers to go on strike. Compulsory balloting, legal notice periods were introduced, picketing was restricted and secondary picketing was outlawed. Having survived the Thatcher decade, I was headhunted by Salford Unemployed and Community Resource Centre in 2001. They were looking for someone to refer, refer, represent clients in social security appeal tribunals. So I was basically offered a job representing people in tribunals on a little bit more money, closer to home and to my daughter's school. And that was an important factor as a young single mum to an eight-year-old child. I realised very quickly that this job was ideal for me. I felt that I was making a real difference to the lives of people in need of support. Once more, I was supporting the underdog in their struggles against the establishment. And this was something that I was incredibly proud to be doing. Simply being able to write off an unmanageable debt or to give somebody a small increase in their weekly income, it has a massive effect on the well-being of many. In the early days, I met Flo. And Flo had come for some help because she was struggling with her finances following the death of her husband. He had always managed the household budget, so she didn't have enough money to pay a gas bill. It became apparent that she was hugely underclaiming, managing on just a small state pension, so we helped us claim pension credit and attendance allowance, which more than doubled her weekly income. So shortly afterwards, I had a letter from Flo thanking me and telling me that she'd not had a holiday since Charles and Diana's wedding but she could now afford to go to Blackpool to spend a few days with a friend. So I was really happy and fulfilled in my work, but then things started to change, very gradually at first, so that not many people would notice. First, welfare rights was taken out of scope for legal aid. This was the warning shot that should have heed been heeded, because very quickly after that, the war on the working class began, thinly disguised as reform. Welfare reform saw the introduction of the bedroom tax. Changes were made to the way fitness for work was decided, making it incredibly difficult for anyone to pass the test. The social fund was cracked, forcing people struggling financially to rely on local authorities. Disability living allowance was replaced with a much harder to qualify for personal independence payment, which has resulted in the removal of benefits from hundreds of people in Salford. It's resulted in many losing their mobility vehicles and even their entitlement to have a carer. Then universal credit was introduced to place all working age benefits and this has undoubtedly forced many people into poverty with its five week waiting period, strict evidence requirements, sanction regime, two child limit and recoverable overpayments for cases including those caused entirely by official error. All of these things were having a huge effect on the people that I supported. And I noticed a huge rise in mental health issues, family breakdowns, drug and alcohol usage, homelessness. The list is endless. And the class war rages on. This government has created a hostile environment for anyone unfortunate enough to be poor. Our most vulnerable are suffering. Our health service is under attack. The United Kingdom currently has the most restrictive anti-union laws in Europe, giving unions very limited protection against being sued for breach of contract. And the attacks on our unions continue, with government now planning to legislate to force agency staff to replace striking workers. Local authority backed budgets have been slashed and public sector workers are receiving below inflation pay rises. We're facing the worst cost of living crisis in decades with food, utilities and fuel costs all expected to rise even further, while Centrica this week announced half-year profits of 1.34 billion. So today, I stand in solidarity with all of our trade union colleagues who, like me, are fighting for justice and equality. Thank you so much. Um, another. Uh, 
uh, inspiring story of, of a woman who, you know, started helping and then realised that she was good at it. There were lots of people who needed helping. Um, has anybody got any questions for Barbara? Why do you think you've had such a big rise in the use of food banks? When I first came across it, it was crisis welfare. I mean, going back 10, 15 years ago. And often for people only on short periods. Why do you think we've had such a big rise? Capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was working at the Unemployed Resource Centre and the local MP, Rebecca Long Bailey, came down one day um, to pay us a visit and she said that she'd just been round the corner opening a food bank. And she had really mixed emotions, as did we, because the fact that she was there to open a food bank to support the residents in her city was amazing. The fact that we needed one wasn't. Um, obviously, poverty is the reason that we've got food banks. But even these days, now people are too poor to donate to the food banks. So food banks are at risk of becoming bankrupt because they simply haven't got the commodity that they trade in. In the past, people could, could afford to buy a little extra with a weekly shop and put it in the basket in the supermarket. These days, them baskets are virtually empty because nobody has spare money to provide for people less fortunate because everybody is less fortunate. And there's only one reason, and that's capitalism. Uh, yes, there was a terrifying piece in the paper last week about whether or not they're going to develop warm banks where you know, uh, people who can't afford to heat their homes can go and sit in the warm for a bit before they go home to where they can't afford the gas. Uh, any more questions? No? Brilliant. All right. Barbara, on that basis, I will let you go uh, and put on one of your other hats as mum and help out your daughter with her thriving business empire. Yes. If anybody's got any time later this afternoon, my daughter's got a stall at the Maker's Market at Sulphur Key, so I'm off down there to help sell her jewellery. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm just going to um, update everybody on Eileen Turnbull. So Eileen um, is the woman who was a researcher for the Shrewsbury 24. Uh, she had agreed to come and speak and was really excited about it and yesterday found out she's got COVID. Uh, for the first time she managed not to get COVID up until this point and uh, now she has it for the first time which just genuinely goes to prove that we can't keep doing things on an individual basis. Um, people, you know, we have to work together, we have to have collective solutions for things and we have to, to you know, show responsibility towards one another. Um, uh, Eileen has been working with the Shrewsbury Pickets for many years and her, uh, the story of the research that she's done is being made into a book that is now available for pre-order. That will be ready on the 6th of September. That is called A Very British Conspiracy, uh, Shrewsbury 24 and the Fight for Justice. Um, I suspect it will be excellent and terrifying in equal measure. Um, I'm very sorry that she can't be here because uh, she and Louise would have, you know, had lots to talk about in terms of doing their research, uh, things that were in archives that were not properly labelled, uh, because the nature of the British justice system is they will only uh, look at things if there is new evidence and it turns out if you're dealing with working class people who people don't respect and care about, they don't file things particularly well. So she kept discovering new things that proved once more that uh, the, uh, what has been termed the biggest uh, miscarriage of uh, justice uh, with regard to the trade union movement was eventually overturned. So uh, that's, uh, you know, her story is, is, is very interesting. And also, her very first job was in the Bryant and May factory in Liverpool. So uh, they would, yeah, so uh, it is a small world after all. Um, so, uh, with regard to uh, things going forward, we're going to take a break for about 45 minutes, if that's okay. And then when we come back, we'll be hearing from Kudzia and from Jenba. So what we'll be looking at after we come back after lunch is how we can uh, think about how um, diversity, inclusion, um, and uh, those kind of broader campaigns beyond the workplace. Because one of the things that, that was very clear in what we've heard is uh, women have been 
uh, undervalued, under-recorded in the workplace, but that also they do a lot of their organising outside of it. You know, they are, uh, you know, they do things like mutual aid, they do things like supporting people who are in crisis, and uh, there's, there's lots of work to do, unfortunately. So, we're going to have a 45 minute break. If everybody can be back here for 1.45, we're going to hear from our last two speakers, and then we should be able to finish slightly early, so you can all go and enjoy the rest of your day. All right, thank you very much, and we'll see you in 45 minutes. I'm a friend of Louise Raw, who's one of the speakers this morning, and um, saw she was speaking at the event. And as a musician, I'm really interested in, in how we get our point across, um, and events like this, really do need support in you know, because um, there aren't enough of them, there aren't enough, um, there aren't enough people um, speaking up for, uh, I hate to use the word minorities because it's about women, you know, so we're talking about 50% of the population but we're still having to do it in the 21st century. So um, for me I think it's, it's vital not only to um, to do what we do. I think it's also important to support other events that, um, that happen um, as well. Uh, the speaker's very good, yes. Uh, I've come along because I'm president of Blackpool Fylde and Wide Trade Union Council. Um, I'm in my second term, the first woman for a very, very long time in that position, uh, with mainly, well, when I first started, uh, mainly just men at the meetings and at the helm. So my goal is to invite more women into trade unionism. Um, so I've come along obviously to this today because I'm really interested you know, in what I can do and how can I do that better? How can I involve not just uh, women, but uh, the younger generation? Because I feel that trade unions desperately need to do something to invite and, and give uh, the younger generation a platform. We are back uh, and uh, we are going to start by hearing from uh, the wonderful Jan and uh, Louise from Jengba Manchester. Uh, Jengba stands for Joint Enterprise Not Guilty by Association and uh, they're going to tell you what it is they do and why. We are the Little Match Girls. <laughs> we were listening but we are the modern day version of the Little Match Girls. We are a woman-led campaign. Um, and, and there's a big reason for that, uh, because Joint Enterprise Not Guilty by Association was founded in 2010 uh, because me and my colleague in London had, I had my son convicted of murder um, <clears throat> and, she, and she had her son, or her, her son's best friend was convicted of murder and they, we both realised, we both knew that neither of these young boys had murdered anyone um, and we couldn't understand why someone who hasn't committed murder could go to prison for murder and it was because of what I would call a legal technicality which is joint enterprise uh, and it's a legal technicality in the prosecution and the police is favour. It means you can go to prison for murder because you possibly foresaw what someone else may do even if they have no intention in the first place, which, when it comes to murder, we all know that there has to be the mental element, the mind to murder. Um, there has to be intention, because otherwise it's called manslaughter or self-defense. In our cases, th th those, bur those burdens of proof, those layers of um, what we would all understand as murder do don't exist. And for a, for a perpetrator in a joint enterprise case, the burden of proof is higher for them than it is for the secondary party. So if I stab Louise and she dies, the prosecution have a higher task in proving that that was murder on my behalf. However, Rachel, who is sat next to me, the burden of proof for her, even, if they, even though they know she didn't stab Louise, is much lower. I go to prison for 24 years if I'm found guilty, so does Rachel. Even though the trial process proves that Rachel didn't murder Louise, that Rachel had no intention to murder Louise, however, what the prosecution
prosecution will say is that she should have or may have had a possible foresight that I might kill her even though I had no intention to do so in the first place. So joint enterprise is a common law for the common people and it makes no common sense. So from sitting in the trial and sort of watching the charade, if you like, uncover at my son's trial, I couldn't, the, the, the one thing that stuck in my mind was this thing about foresight, possibility, and the phrase joint enterprise. So when my, my son, who, who at the time was 15 years old and blind, um, and I've always argued, how can someone who can't see in the first place have foresight and, of the actions and possible actions of someone else that they can't see in the first place? So I went, to, I went home, I googled the phrase joint enterprise, and the only thing I could find was a hip replacement surgeon in Australia. There was no legal explanation of joint enterprise on the internet. If you Google it now, you'll find loads of information, which means the campaign itself has actually put that phrase into the British psyche. So that, that has actually come from us. It hasn't come from lawyers, it hasn't come from the police, it hasn't come from the government, it's come from a woman's campaign. And like I said at the beginning, we call ourselves a woman's campaign because it's the women that fight, because it's our children, and it's our husbands and partners that this usually puts in prison. So men can't fight because they're doing life sentences. So it's up to us to fight for the men that we love, for the children that we love, for the people who we love, we are fighting for them. And that's normally left to women anyway. Um, obviously, we have families who, um, a, a dad is there and his son or daughter has been put in prison. But what it tends to happen is that dad has to go to work and keep the rest of the family going. Um, so the task of fighting injustice is left to the women. <coughs> and we do a good job of it as well. Now, the campaign started in 2010, and by 2016, we managed to get one of our cases to the Supreme Court. Um, <clears throat> we were vindicated because the senior judges in the country acknowledged that the law had actually taken a wrong turn in 1984. So that was 32 years of injustice throughout the country, 32 years of injustice. Um, can you imagine how many people it's affected? I mean, we support 1,500 men, women, and children. Um, <clears throat> that's just the tip of the iceberg. <coughs> Sorry. But um, the Supreme Court acknowledged that the foresight element wasn't enough, wasn't enough to convict someone of murder. There had to be other evidence with it. So they still use possible foresight. Uh, so it hasn't gone away, but they use it with, with other evidence. Um, so we've still got a fight in our hands. And after the Supreme Court as well, we, it was bittersweet because we did think we'd won something and we did think that people would be released from prison. But to date, uh, since 2016, only one person has had their conviction quashed. So we're supposed to believe that after 32 years of injustice, only one person, they only got it wrong with one person, uh, which is a nonsense. And I'm going to argue that one person is because I think it's really important to, to show you that the people that we do support are not murderers, um, that they are good people, and that they're just like you or I. Um, they might have had a bad past and things might have gone wrong, and they might have been you know, in a situation that got them involved with someone who did commit murder, but it doesn't mean that they are a murderer. But the one person that was acquitted was John Crilly, and he was one of the people on the London Bridge terror attack in 2019. Um, this is a man, if he hadn't been acquitted, he wouldn't have been on London Bridge. He wouldn't have saved multiple lives that day and he wouldn't have got a commendation from the police. He got the highest commendation in the country, um, <clears throat> which, which incidentally he didn't want to accept because as far as he was concerned, the system and the police are what ruined his life and all of our lives because we're still fighting and he isn't. Now, what we found out as the years went on after the Supreme Court judgment, I mean, when, when you read the judgment, it's hundreds of pages long. Um, <clears throat> and it talks about Chang Wan Su, which, which, you know, I, I'd never heard of that. It was, it was, it's a phrase that comes up in, 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 in 
courtrooms, and obviously defendants are not going to be aware of what Chang Wan Su is, but basically Chang Wan Su is, is, the, is the case where it went wrong, and it's quite, it's, if you think that British justice is supposed to be the envy of the world, well the place that Chang Wan Su went wrong was actually Hong Kong, so we took something that went wrong in Hong Kong, and we delivered that injustice for 32 years to the people in this country. Uh, that's quite appalling, I think. And, that, and I think another thing that we need to remember is when we talk about our grief, truth and justice campaign, when we talk about the miners' strike, it's quite, it's quite telling to remember that those happened in 1984, when the miners, when 95 miners, or however many it was, were being arrested and they wanted to charge them collectively. They wanted to charge them collectively. For some reason, our government decided that Chang Wang Su in Hong Kong would be a really good legal principle to bring into this country. Fortunately for the miners at the time, the charge was dropped before they could actually go to trial. But what we need to recognise is if they had gone to trial, <clears throat> every single one of them would have been found guilty of joint enterprise, regardless of what happened that day, and they would have served prison sentences. It didn't work for them, but however, as the years have gone by, um, <clears throat> it's not, it, it wasn't relevant in the 80s, not very, not, not very often, and even, even the early 90s. But it started to become a real tool for the prosecution and the police as you draw into the late 90s and then again into the 2000s, probably around 2004, 2005. So you have to ask, ask yourself, where did it come from? Because the police, if you ask a policeman what, what joint enterprise is, he won't be able to tell you. If you ask certain lawyers what it is, 10, 15 years ago, they wouldn't be able to tell you. So you've got to think, where has it come from? It's come from government, it's a policy. It's a policy made uh, decision <clears throat> to actually damage the working class. It's been, sat, someone has sat down in the room decided that this is a really good way to fill our prisons. It's a good way to get working class children at a young age and stick them into prisons for 10, 15, 20 years. Why would you want to do that? What happens in prison that they need to have them packed? The, the prison population has doubled in the last 20 years. How can it double? Are we, are we, are, are we a country full of criminals? If you look at the life sentences that we have in this country, I think about five, six years ago, it, it was ours, our prison population was something like 20% of them were life sentence prisoners. And at the time, if you looked at the whole of Europe combined, the ones that were doing life sentences there, in the whole of Europe in comparison to us was just 3%. So you have to recognise that there's obviously something dreadfully wrong in our justice system or we are a country of homicidal murderers. We've also discovered, and I know people say they don't like statistics, but <clears throat> between 2006 and 2016, in this country we put, we put almost 200 children in prison for murder and gave them life sentences. No other country in Europe does that, none at all. They don't even do that to children that murder someone. We do it for children who haven't murdered anyone. And, and, and give them a life sentence, and a life sentence is 99 years. So our campaign is, it, it isn't just about, about, the, about abolishing joint enterprise. It, it's led us into realising that these sentences that we give people, it, it opened my eyes to realise that <clears throat> we actually continue to give children life sentences in this country, so you only need to be 10 years old and be at the scene of a murder, or know someone who commits a murder. You don't have to touch the victim, you don't have to be involved in any way, and you're still getting a life sentence. The, young, the youngest child we support <clears throat> is just 12 years old. Um, that 12 year old, I think he served six years in prison, didn't inflict any injury on the victim. But he'll have to be in probation services for the next 99 years, for the rest of his life. But when he was convicted, <clears throat> And this is how young and how they don't understand what's going on. When the judge handed him in sentence and said he was giving him life, he turned to his mum and said, Mummy, what's life? That tells, you know, if he doesn't understand that, he's not going to understand what, what happens in the courtroom. Uh, 
<clears throat> I've been fighting for my son for 15 years. Um, when he was 15, and like I said, but he was blind. He didn't touch the victim. I fought for all of his prison sentence. He got 12 years. Um, he didn't get released for 13 and a half years because one of the things that happens is if, if you fight and you maintain your innocence, they'll put something in place. They have to release you, but they'll put whatever method in place, like stalling your parole hearing for as long as possible so that you don't get out on time, so that you do actually get a further punishment. <coughs> but he's out now, and I'm grateful for that, but he's left with lots of restrictions. Um, <clears throat> But what I've found is over the last maybe 12 months, it's actually getting worse. We've got cases coming to us. They used to, cases used to come to us and it was always maybe three people. Three people getting convicted and we knew that two of them weren't the murderer. Then it started, started to become five people. <clears throat> the number now that, that the CPS are going for, and it's almost like a magic number for them is 10. Because number 10 is um, when they call people gangs, it sounds more believable that someone is a gang of 10 as opposed to a gang of three. Now, at the, the campaign at the moment is, <clears throat> we, we've sort of moved up a little bit of a level, but we do want to go back to our grassroots, you know, how we are being on the streets, talking to people, rather than, because we're not lawyers, we don't want to act as if we're lawyers and we know everything about the law. Uh, but what we do know is that this is wrong and it's unjust and we can't put up with it, we can't watch other families go through what we, we go through. But we will we will go down the legal route, we will go to Parliament, we will tell the MPs that they have to listen to us because they work for us. <clears throat> and a few years ago I heard a lady, her name was Janet Alda, and I don't know if you've heard of her, but she, her brother was, was killed in a police station and, and, and the police that murdered her, her brother never got prosecuted for murder, never spent a, a day in prison. But one of the things she said in her speech was, <clears throat> who prosecutes the prosecutors? And for about 10 years now, that's been one thing that I would love to do. I would love to prosecute the prosecutors. Um, <clears throat> and we've actually reached that point because the campaign's now working with Liberty Human Rights. And we've asked them, can't we prosecute the prosecutors? And because of the work we've done so far, asking for data, asking for meetings to be told, no, there's nothing wrong with the law, everything is perfectly okay. You're just mothers of people who don't like the length of their sentences that they've got. Um, the, the, jury made, the jury of their peers decided that this was right. These are all the phrases we've, met, we've listened to, you know, from these learned gentlemen who supposedly know exactly what they're doing. Um, but we fa we, we've put a letter before claim to the, to the CPS, the Crime Prosecution Service. So the sort of head of head of the legal services in this country, Max Hill, who's the director of public prosecutions, who's ignored us for years. Suddenly, because we're going to sue him, because we want to take the biggest prosecutor in the land and prosecute him, it's only now. It's only now that we've got to the point where we can do what Janet Alder asked who prosecutes the prosecutors, and that's us, that's the little match girls. Because, you know, we, we might just be women and we might be locked down upon from everyone who thinks that our children are murderers. Because there, there's no worse feeling in the world. There's no greater shame than seeing your son's face on the front cover of a, of a newspaper and reading the utter diabolical lies of how your son is an evil, feral, wolf pack, murdering scumbag, uh, or, or to have to read in the Sun newspaper that because of your murderous son and his murderous friends, that the Sun newspaper decides we have to bring back the death penalty. So we are, myself and Louise, and all the other mothers that we support, we are the lowest of the low as far as the British media is concerned. As far as every MP in the country up until quite recently, we are not to be we are not to be given a voice. We are not to be listened to because we just don't like the sentences our loved ones have got. But that's not the reality. We don't like what you have done to our sons and our husbands. We don't like that you have abused us, that you treat us this way, and that you continue to do so. 
and it and it has taken almost 15 years for me personally. The campaign's been around for about 12 years. <clears throat> But yeah, if, if you go outside into the street and you talk to an ordinary person, I don't know if any of you know what joint enterprise is, but if you go out into the street and you ask an ordinary person, they won't have a clue. They'll have no idea what it is. And, they'll have, and if you tell them this is how it works, <clears throat> they won't believe you because none of us have been brought up or educated to think that someone who hasn't murdered anyone and can prove that they haven't murdered anyone could possibly go to prison for life for murder. I'm going to hand you to Louise to see what she... Yeah. There you go. Let's move that one. Thank you. Is that it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm Louise. Um, 2017, I met Jan. I was introduced to John by a lecturer from the Manchester University. I um, was told this lady can help you. You need to speak to this lady. At the time, I was very close to even meeting John. Um, obviously, we was going through the court process at the time. Unfortunately, I didn't really listen to her. I was thinking, who's this woman, this crazy lady? Go away. Um, and then here we are six years down the line. Actually, the family engagement office of four gender now. Um, but in them early days, I can't even start to tell you how heartbreaking it is to watch a child turn green when he's convicted of murder, knowing he, he didn't touch the victim. And the day after sentencing, when they handed him down a mandatory life sentence with a tariff of 20 years for somebody else's crime, I don't know how I've done it, but I got myself up. And I went to Manchester and joined a, a march with um, a campaign group for IPPs. And to be honest with you, I've not stopped since. It nearly killed me. I've had to come full circle to get back to full health again. I mean, it really did nearly kill me. Um, like Jan said, my son was one of 10 that was convicted. A total of 168 years was handed down to them boys. Only one person took the life that day. There was, you could have wide ranged everybody, no one needed to be given the same charge. Because obviously, only one person took the life. There was no intention, there was no plan, there was no foresight this was going to happen. The judge in our trial even said it was just a spontaneous event. But then still went right, hundreds of life sentences, it even directed them basically took it from their own thought for process and basically called them all a gang. Now, in this day and age, if my son was even friends with the rest of these boys, they would have at least been friends on social media, none of that, not even Facebook, nothing. But, you know, because you might have been living in the same area, you might have gone to the same high school or primary school, these are the connections they use to collectively convict them. Um, so I had to go through all that. Um, so yeah, come full circle with this, been camping ever since. But through my own experience, what I noticed after my son's conviction is there's an age group missing from Moss Side and Hume, Fallowfield and Rushall, and they're all predominantly mixed race and black boys. I literally can tell you now there's a whole there's a, there's a whole age range disappearing now. To me, that's ethnic cleansing. So a lot of these boys are very young. They haven't got children of their own. They're not likely to have children of their own because they're serving life sentences 20 years upwards. So when they come out, all the good ladies have gone. You know, they're not at the age of where they want children because they've already got families. They've moved on. These boys are coming out. With, so that is their taking away the next generation so they're not going to end up having children. Then that continues to go trickle down. We just had another case of another 10 boys convicted. Conspiracy charges, text messages. I, I just don't, and there was no victim to that crime. It was text messages, but you've been handed down some horrific, horrific sentences. I just don't understand how we're allowing it to continue. 
and Manchester seems to be like really rife with it at the moment. Um, the, I've had untold phone calls from very upset parents and we're getting younger, 13 year olds now. I'm hearing of groups of 13 year olds on trial for murder or likely to be on trial for murder that one person's committed. You know what you like at the ages, you barely, it's like playground antics. Something's like when everyone's looking, you're gonna get charged. You really and truly gonna get charged. But what I did notice is the case from Hill Barnes. Now, that should have been, if they're saying that it's correct, that should have been a joint enterprise. It should have all been locked up and sent to prison. Not even the murderer got sent to prison. So, you know, what's that? Oh, he's, he's got a future. He's, he's come from a, a wealthy um, family. Oh, we can't possibly destroy his life. So, you know, this is what we're up against. And it's proving it to me that the working class communities are targeted. We're going to continue to be targeted unless we stand up and really say, look, enough's enough. Um, we're not going to accept these racist stereotypes of our communities to continue. And now, what they're kind of saying, oh, well, we're not racist. We're going to go and convict these 10 white boys. And this is what they're doing to say, oh, we're not racist. But none of this is racist. Nothing to see here. And this is where we're at. This is why we have to come back to, like Jan says, grassroots, back on the streets, shouting for justice. Um, I will never give up on my son. There's no way I'm going to stand by and see him serve 20 years for someone else's crime. There's not a chance. They're telling me these boys in the dock was my son's friend. I'd never ever seen him. If you're my son's friend, you've been at my house, you've had dinner, you've stayed overnight, your stinking trainers are at the bottom of my stairs, when I open the front door. I know you, I know my son's friends. Now, it's, it's mad, I had a, a gathering, and his, his friends were all there, and I took a picture, and there was a space, and some, I think it was you said, that's where the house should be sat. And it made me quite upset because I was thinking, well, these are his friends. Not one of them was on the trial with him, you know. So I just, I just couldn't believe that these false narratives, because that's why it was false narratives, actually worked. And then the, the trial was split into two, Manchester and Preston. And everyone on the jury, now I make sure it's my mum's wife, but everyone on that jury was white. Went to Preston to see their trial. Everyone on that jury was white. We live in a very diverse community. How's everybody white? How you, to me, you get judged by a panel of your peers. There was no one of a certain under 30 age range. And to be honest with you, they would, the, the, the word gang gets used and you see black faces or brown faces. And for some reason, it's just accepted. Oh yeah, there was uh, Moss Side got mentioned. Gooch and Dodd at then got mentioned at my son's trial. My son was not even thought about when Gooch and Dodd at then existed. They weren't even a twinkle in my eye, never mind running the street with them. I couldn't believe that. And this, they didn't say, oh, he's done A, B, and C, because he lives in Moss Side, where Gooch and Dodd at then used to be. I thought, you, you're being serious. Then it was mentioned gangs in New York. He's never been to New York. How this is evidence, this and they were lapping it up. It was like it was so surreal. I can't even explain explain it to be fair, but yeah. So when the realms found guilty and gave the, the tariff of 20 years, I had to walk out. And one of the officers that is part of Excalibur, he apologized to me on my way out of the courtroom and said sorry, because I don't think he believed that that was gonna happen. And he apologised, I thought it was a bit late for your apologies. You've just got me some convicted to other life sentence. An apology is not good to me. So since then, I've been a thorn in their side, so to speak. And I went to a, a recent neighbourhood community meet and greet with the police, actually. And I've might, well, I think my go, but I've, I am now going in to watch their diversity training. Because they kept saying, oh, we've got all this money for new officers, which, yeah, that's great. So I asked, where's the money to retrain the officers that you've all got, already got on the street to safeguard against racism and the stereotypes that they're using to get these convictions? And it was like, oh, we've got no money for that. I said, well, why haven't you got money for that? The deputy mayor was stood there, so I'm asking her, you know, can't you go back to the mayor and ask, 
where's the money for the training of your the officers that you're going to send our new officers on the beat with and they're going to show how they police and in my in my opinion it's quite racist how they police us um so i think that's where we need to be is the, the form, it starts with the police, it starts with how they're policing the communities and the, the way they are policing it has to change. So I think they need to put some more, I know they do all this diversity training but I don't think it goes far enough. I think we need to see what they're actually teaching them in these training courses, document it so we all can see it and I don't think they're going far enough. I think there's a lot of wrong guns in Greater Manchester Police. They, they, they even admitted that they are racist and openly admitted it in Moss Side in the neighborhood uh, policing um, meeting, which I thought was very strange because then when the, the next thing is, oh, no, we don't see colour. Well, they clearly do. They've just been blatantly, you know, telling everybody that they are. So this is where we're at. Now we've got a office here in Manchester because it's needed now, it's needed more than ever. We need to start putting down roots here, letting them know we're going nowhere. And we've got the bill on the 6th, the amendment, but it's all, all, all coming together. <laughs> Alright, so I'll leave it there. I don't know what else to say, but yeah, thanks very much. Thank you so much for, for sharing with us and for telling us about your ongoing work. Has anybody got any questions? We have a question over there. Thanks, Kev. Um, I just wanted to ask whether, because um, I don't know much about joint enterprises, whether it applies to all crimes or just murder, and what proportion of those are based in the working class community, or whether is ever been used to convict people of, let's say, financial crime and things like that, or whether it is just specifically tied to the working class community. Yeah, it, it, it's specific. Yeah, it can be used in all crimes, but we we find that it, it is predominantly murder and manslaughter, and, and, and it comes with the highest penalty, which is which makes it more heinous than anything at all. You know, I mean, we've had people contact us and said, "Oh, I've got convicted of, I don't know." breaking an entry back in 1983 or whatever, 86, and, and it's like, well, if you don't, it's too far back, we don't even know what, 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 what they used it or whatever. And they might have got, like, I don't know, suspended sentence, but as far as we're concerned, that, that, that you know, yeah, you, you, it might have ruined your life if, if you were guilty, but we're talking about, we, we're talking about murder, yeah, um, and life sentences and long sentences. I mean, we've got, the sentences are so long that, you know, I mean, I had a woman on the phone yesterday and she, her husband's not been sentenced yet and she just said he might as well be dead. He'll be, he'll be 75 before he's up for parole. She said, my, my life's over, I might as well be dead, he might as well be dead. You know, and, and this is, this, I mean, we, we're like, we're like a counselling service as well. It's, it's really distressing listening to a, a, a mum who's 18 year old has just been given longer in prison than he's been alive. You know, and she's heard a judge say, I'm going to put you in prison. I'd, in fact, we have judges who say, I don't know what part you played in this murder, yeah. but I have no choice but to give you a starting point of 25 years. Yeah. And it's like, oh, please tell a man what he's done, you know, before you're going to persecute him. But, but, but yeah, like we said, the case in Hales Barn, I mean, I know of two or in the last sort of 10 years, you know, both, you know, Millionaire's Row and all these places where someone's in very similar circumstances. I mean, the Hales Barn one, one boy stuck a knife through the heart of another. He then lied to the police, um, taunted, the taunted the family. The person who was with him didn't even get, you know, didn't even go to the police station. He wrote a statement at home and it was accepted and he never, spent it, never entered the courtroom. The boy that did it, not only was, a, was he a liar and he killed someone, wasn't even charged with murder or manslaughter. Also, he was allowed to put off sentencing so he could be at home for Christmas with his family. I just thought, it, it, the mind boggles now. The judges always say their hands are tied uh, because they have to, they have to go within what they, the laws of, yeah, the guidelines. Now the guideline for murder is mandatory life. 
There's no getting away from it. So, that's why they didn't charge him, because yeah, he never got it. because that's exactly what, true, that's why he never got charged with that. I think he didn't even serve 12 months. No, he served four, he got four months. Four months for taking a life. Now, if that would have been our children in Moss Side Tune, Fallowfield, Rush Hour, oh, it's bye, you're not ever coming home. You know, and do, and do you know how expensive it is? You think, oh, everything's free in prison? No, it's not. I send 50 quid every single week to my son. Um, for the food, his toiletries, like this heat wave that's just happened, it, his fan had broke. I said, how are you coping? He said, not very, very well, to be honest with you. Because they couldn't even get a fan sent in because the ones that were like available were too expensive. You know, it's horrendous actually. I think they haven't, like a lot of boys that I'm thinking of here, when their hair, these hair products, they don't even do the hair products, but if there was something there, if you're talking, it might be 15, 20 pounds for that hair product. Now, a lot of your mental health is feeling good within yourself. You know, my son likes to always come out on a visit, look well, even though he might go back and be like, he wants me to see him doing well. Even though he might not there, he might go back in there and be like, ooh. But he wants to put on that show when he comes out to see mum, dad, sister, nano. He's, he's very lucky that he's got a big family and we all support him, Jennifer support him, but there's a lot of families out there, single mums, that can't send that money into their child for the rest of their lives, may not be alive when their child comes home. One mum, I think her son's 38 years ago, but it, it weren't his crime, so she's definitely not going to be alive when he comes home. You know, he's got no children, and that's all, I hear that quite a bit. It's, I'm going to be dead before my child comes home. You know, then they can't come out to the funerals of the grandparents. You're lucky at, at the moment to be allowed out to a, a parent's funeral because of COVID and everything else. During COVID, I didn't physically see my son over 32 years. It was a, a Zoom visit that kept going off. If you moved, you slightly moved, it went off. And then the technology that they do I'm like not very good with technology, so I'm trying to get myself on this purple app visit thing. And then I'm having parents saying to me, I don't know how to do it, I can't do it. And then that, that person's not seeing their child. You know, it's, it's really, really bad. But it does cover all crimes. And I never forget this. Um, it was at Mayor's Question Time about, I think it was 2018 time. And um, Bev Hughes, the deputy mayor, she said, oh, we need joint enterprise to convict parents that both kill their child. I've never seen that on TV yet. I've not seen both parents get done with murder. One will get done with murder, and the other might get done with neglect or allowing that to happen, but they don't both get murder charges. So that's a blatant lie as well. It's, if, if it suits them, you're gonna get done with joint enterprise. If yeah. I, I, was a, I was at a conference last week and, and one of the women said, oh, I, I read a joint enterprise. It's when you don't know who's done it, so you do them all. And I said, there's nothing in British law like that. Why, you know, isn't it, isn't it better to release 10 guilty men than let one innocent man go to prison? That is the cornerstone of British justice. But somehow, it's somehow, whether it's the media or misinformation, people, even though they don't agree with it, will come out with phrases like that. Well, we don't, like the, if we don't know which parent killed a child. A judge will tell you, if we don't know which parent killed a child, we have to release them both, and that's it, right? And, and joint enterprise completely turns all of that on its head because they don't care who's done it. They know who's done it every time, but they don't care who goes with them. It's just, one big lie, but the, but that lie is never used on the rich. It's never used on on the politicians when they had uh, the expenses scandal, because whoever was whoever was handing those expenses in and whoever was giving it to them, they were committing a crime. Not just the MP, everybody in that office, all of them should have gone to jail for stealing, but none of them did. Boris Johnson and his party, every single one of them were there. Everyone who organised it, it's a joint enterprise, and. 
and you know, if they use it on them like they do on us, they wouldn't have had to prove very much. I mean, we could have had the entire, we could have had the whole of Westminster in Belmarsh, and we could have started all over again. <laughs> yeah. But it doesn't happen that way, does it? I think before 1984, um, the version of joint enterprise, as my uncle would tell you, was called Innocent Until Proven Irish. Yeah. And, 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 it, and it's a simple philosophy that chooses a segment of the community and victimises them. I think Louise would have really appreciated, and I will send Louise a picture of the, 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 the match, match women imagery, I think she'd really enjoy that. But I want to see a criminal justice system that takes somebody that's perceived to have or done something wrong or perceived to have done something wrong and helps them and integrates them back into the community. And I was wondering Mark, when, when Matt raised this question about giant enterprise. So if there was a police officer who'd exposed themselves to women and there were concerns about he was going to attack women and that police, and it was known to his supervisors and that police officer went on to kill a woman, are his, are his supervising officers, are they guilty of giant enterprise? But the difficulty we have, and we can link this to kind of greed, if you build a super court in Manchester, you've got to justify that decision by filling it up, by filling it up with young men. If you build private prisons over and over again, instead of rehabilitating people in the community at about 6,000 quid a year, you lock them up for 42,000 pounds a year and you stain that person forever. And there's nothing whatsoever to say that that person will come out as an integrated member of the community. So, I'll put my um, president of the Greater Manchester Association hat on now and commit to gender and commit to work and to promote gender um, in the, not, not just in the coming year, but in the coming years. I was really pleased that when we had our last meeting and, and it was when all them young men were sent, 10 young men were sentenced um, for basically text messaging, it shows my age, they don't text, but they, they WhatsApp each other. Um, but I, I, we suggested to the, to the committee that we break and we go and support them. Uh, outside the library, and uh, you know, there was a race to get there. We're all massively keen to do it, and that's the enthusiasm we want because it links. It links what's wrong with the community. It links what's wrong with capitalism. It links the kind of racism that's applied to young men. Because I know you're trying to get the statistics about who these de uh, de 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 um, joint enterprises apply to. I'd be willing to bet that they are young black men. I think we've been, um, there won't be nobody like me, there'll be no kind of ageing grey bloke in there. <laughs> Last time um, I kind of looked at some of them stats, um, it, I don't like the term, but they were using the term main. Um, I think it was like 43% within our criminal justice system. Then, when a lot within society itself, I think, Someone of colour only makes up like 16%. It's very, 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 very small. I could be wrong on the numbers, but it's very, something's very like that. Um, but that was a few years I looked at that. But that just kind of goes to show, really. We're filling our, we're filling our prisons with all the black men. <laughs> you know, I just, I can't get my head around it. My granddad came here and swore up the allegiance to this country. So did my father-in-law, very proud to be a British citizen, very, very proud. I was kind of relieved that one of my, my son's grandfather had actually died when he got fully convicted of this crime because we would all be getting a whipping for that, I tell you. Because he would be like, how has this happened? Because he, he believed in law, he believed in the process of law. And he would have been like, but he must have done something. He must have, because he wouldn't have stood joint enterprise. He, he would have been like, no, he must have done something. And I think that would have just killed him in himself. That why is my grandson in prison for something he's not done? You know, but he quite right. Joint enterprise, everyone I know in a joint enterprise, because I kept meeting all these white ladies on all the marches, thinking, keep telling me everyone's black on these cases. <laughs> then they show me a picture of their child who gives me a trace. I'm like, ah, right. So yeah, you're quite right. It's like I say, now they're trying to convict. Um, more white, you know, batteries going. <laughs> More um, white children. But 
we've got a long way to catch up on that still. So yeah, we need to stop it before it's your grandson, it's your son, it's your brother, it's your nephew or it's your cousin. We need to stop it. I mean, our, our, new, our new slogan now is abolish or reform, yeah. nothing in between, yeah. nothing in between. Mm. And I think abolish would be right because there are other laws that you can use. You know, if somebody, if, if somebody's, if someone commits, a, if, if, if there's a big fight and someone has a, and plays a part in a big fight, then it's violent disorder. Charge them with that. Afraid, whatever it is, whatever crime, even if it's a drug deal gone wrong, you're the drug, you, you know, you've been dealing drugs, charge them with the crime they commit, not the crime that someone else commits. So to abolish it would be really easy and just put, you know, those, those, those parts of the law that already exist and put them into place. I just wanted to ask what's just been brought in into the courts about high profile sort of murders and everything, the cameras, which of course they've been resisting for a very long time because they don't want to, the prosecutors, when we say who's prosecuting the prosecutors, so the prosecutors didn't want that to happen really because they didn't want their faces to be full on on the camera. Yeah. Do you think that that might be an advantage for you? Because if we get some of these cases, they have to explain fully why they've come to that decision. If you're going to televise a sentencing for the public, you need to televise the whole trial because then the public get a proper understanding of the evidence used, the witnesses' statements, and it will, they won't ever do it because then it shows that there's no evidence needed yeah. in a court. I mean, if they, I if, they did, if they did do a joint enterprise case, they'd probably do one where it was correct. You know, yeah. like where a woman mm. planned to kill a husband and they proved that she bought the gun and then it all went into action and it was done. They'd probably use a case where it was bang to rights and they'd televise that and everyone would go, well, that's why it's right. They would never, ever televise a case like my son's or Louise's. No, I believe never. they're appeasing the public because um, there is some horrendous cases out there. But yeah. It's stupid to say, you know, no one's com committed these crimes. So I mean, we've got men who were in prison at the time when the crime was committed. Yeah. How did he shoot someone? He was in jail. You know, you, because, and, and that was on the basis that he, his brother had phoned him earlier in the day. Or he'd phoned his brother earlier in the day. And, and all the prosecution the said was, well, you must, have been, you must have been telling him to go out and do it. And it transpires as year went, years went by. And this was a ten, a multi-handed case where they went, five people out of that case went to the Court of Appeal and they got the convictions quashed because it was proven, oh no, they didn't go to appeal, they, they, they put the trial in two halves, so the first five were convicted on the basis of this gun which shot the victim and the guy in prison uh, got 35 years for it because apparently he told them to do it even though there was no evidence that he did that because there was no voice recording, nothing. So when the next five went to court, same trial, same thing, they were all acquitted, they were all found not guilty because the gun the police had provided wasn't the murder weapon. So the first five then went to the Court of Appeal and said, well, the other five who were supposed to have done this murder with were all acquitted, and it's been proven that the gun that you said we used wasn't the gun. And do you know what the judge said? You should have got a better forensic expert during the trial. And they all remain in, cha in jail for 35 years plus. Yes. One of the things they said after the Supreme Court, it was that the judges were afraid of, of, of the media. And one of the first things that the media said the next day, it was a historic victory, it was amazing. The whole press should have been on our side, but instead, Jemba want to let murderers out of prison. Yeah. No, we don't. We want to let innocent people out. So the judges knew that that was going to be the, what the commentators were going to say, and that they'd, they'd, they'd make the judges, they'd embarrass these judges that had made the decision that it was wrong. So they put a little clause in there. Right, so called the substantial injustice test, which is a test that is impossible to meet, so that none, of, so that the Daily Mail and the Sun couldn't embarrass the judges, because the judges are too, to, to be embarrassed is too, it's too important to them, than for our children to spend the rest of their lives in prison, for us to have this misery inflicted on us. They'd sooner that than have a couple of comments in the Daily Mail about them. This is how rotten these people are. They're, and they are rotten to the core. Don't ever forget that. Thank you so much yeah, for um, telling us about what's going on. Um, uh, 
we will follow up and we'll make sure that everybody here gets to know uh, what we can do to offer our support to you, uh, the families that you're supporting, uh, who we can write to, how we can stand up and say this is madness and we won't stand for it. Um, we're going to finish up with Kudzia. Thanks, and um, I, I do say the last real job I had was a teacher, um, and I'm going to do this a bit like a teacher, and I'm going to end with a story, so you can all go home with a nice story. But can I just say, can we give a round of applause to Louise and Jan? For the work that I do is around equality, so it, it works around women's qualities, race equalities, disability, and LGBT+. Plus. And I'm really sad to hear about your families, but what it does just do is highlight you know, the problems that are facing um, black and ethnic minority people all throughout their lives. And I think really it demonstrates when we see the absolute extreme of those. And I think that the intersection as well of being working class, being black is a life sentence really that is deliberately designed to end that way. And I thought your reflections on the impact that that has on um, the generations yeah. is absolutely right. And you know, I'm not a conspiracist. We've seen what happened with Windrush. We saw what happened with black people that came to this country legally, how they were treated. We've seen what a hostile environment is doing currently. We're seeing what, you know, Priti Patel will do if she gets wind of the fact now, you might even have thought about doing something wrong. So none of this is in isolation. And I think it's really interesting as well when we have quite clearly in the Geneva Convention, Article 33, which is you can't be collectively punished. No person can be punished for a crime they, would, they did not commit. And yet our interpretation of law is designed to be so... Um, tricky to understand and dismantle so that it serves a certain purpose. So you have my solidarity and from our committee and I'll talk to Kev about how we can we can talk about that as well. But I'm also here to talk about another group of, women, of people that really get that intersection and you know again it won't be lost that we have two women talking about this and the impact of decisions on women is always magnified. Um, and I do apologise, it's going to get a little bit depressing before we have a little call to arms. And it's going to get depressing because it's really crap if you're a woman, right? It's really, really crap if you're a poor woman, it's really, really crap if you're a poor black woman, etc, etc. But the common factor is if you're a woman, the system is stacked against you. When I say the system, I mean the world of work, but I also mean in our movement as well. And we really need to take decisive action to change that. Right, and that means we need people. I mean, Kev, what was that description you used? Was it old and greying? What was it? Aging stands for aging grey men. Aging grey men. What I, behind their backs, sometimes call them people that are pale, male, and stale, and know <laughs> to their faces. Um, with love, though, um, for us all to, I think, work together and think about really solid solutions, which are, how are we going to get more women into decision-making seats, right? What are we going to do? And how are we going to empower those people to make change? Because let's be clear, we can't say to employers, your um, pay gap is crap, your flexible working policies are rubbish, if our own movement can't hold the same amount of weight for women. And that's not to say it doesn't, it, it is getting there, but we just need to do so much more, so much faster. You know, I can count on one hand the amount of women, uh, sorry, the amount of women in our movement that are general secretaries, that have the top decision. I can count on two hands the amount that are presidents. And yet women make up over 50% of the workforce. So they should be making over 50% of those big, big decisions and those big, big jobs. And Again, I'm not a conspiracist, so I know the reason that they are not is deliberate, right? This is a system that was designed by men for men. And it was designed to keep women out, and we really need to start to dismantle that. We need to make sure that we are pushing for the issues that affect women. We need to make sure we're making places accessible to women. And we need to really set the culture and the climate where women can thrive. 
And guys, that I mean, we need to tackle some serious things like sexual harassment in our movement and sexual harassment in the workplace. Huge, huge issues. Um, over, we did a poll recently, and over two thirds of women came back and said they've been sexually harassed, which is awful. Do you know what's more awful? We know that's not the real number. We know the real number is actually much higher. And the reason we know the real number is much higher is because the next question told us that four out of five women don't want to report that they've been sexually harassed. And that is because what happens? Well, what happens is you don't really get believed, you get moved around, and then there's a massive fear of reprisal. Um, and I know I'm jumping all over the place because I don't want to keep you late, but also there are so many things we need to address if we are serious about um, equalising for women and pushing women forward. If we are serious about taking up the things that Louise and Jan are talking about and really learning from them as well, not just in terms of the experiences of their children, but also their own experiences in fighting that fight for justice. And whilst these are two ends of, you know, of an extreme, they are not disconnected. And I think it's really important that we look at them like that. Um, so, I think the pandemic really shone a light on what it's like for women. And we were talking earlier uh, about, you know, the fact that which industries were hit hard. Well, it's the industries that women worked in. Like, if you worked in care, if you worked in um, retail, if you worked in catering, if you worked in um, anything that's considered a woman's job, it was hit hard by the pandemic. And it was hit hard because it was shut down, rightly so, but it was shut down with any support structure or mechanism for women to build back. And what we also found was that when we reopened, it was done with a real focus on traditional male jobs. And the reality is, that has set women even further back, further back into poverty and further back away from being empowered. Um, we did some research recently and found that in work poverty is at the highest it has been forever. Um, I was really interested when we had the question about food banks, you know, it would, you know, we would have all heard recently about who are accessing food banks and people that are accessing food banks are the people that we've always considered to be professional people, people with good jobs. And I think the pandemic has highlighted that that isn't the case and we really have to put the stoppers down or risk pushing women further into inequality and further into injustice. But I think we underestimate women at our peril as well. Again, the reason Jan have shown what happens uh, when actually women decide enough is enough. But what we need is the systems and structures to support that. Now, I'm gonna stop there. If you catch me talking at any point, I will expand on all of those with massive amounts of um, depth. Um, I'm not known for my brevity, so I'm being really good today. I'm just very happy. Um, but I'm going to finish on a story, and this is my own personal journey. Well, it's not mine really, it's my mum's. But she's, she's died, so I get to tell it as my story, because no one can snitch on me. A long time ago, which is why I joke about it all the time. It makes people really uncomfortable. Um, so my mum didn't consider herself a trade unionist, right, until much later in life. And if you grew up a, a minority in this country, one of the first things you're taught is you must join a trade union. If you're at work, you join a trade union because a trade union has your back. And whilst the relationship between trade unions and black people hasn't always been the friendliest, it's been better than anything else that's been out there. And it's really important that you join the trade union. So I did. Um, but my mum was a first generation immigrant, and she just wanted to keep her head down and get on with her job, right? and avoid doing anything that made her stand out or get her in trouble with the boss. And again, if you know women, if you know black people, you know that is a common, common message. It's also why people sometimes don't want to join you, <coughs> don't want to get in any trouble. Um, but despite her assertion you know, that she wasn't interested in politics, or funny business as she called it, in 1977, she and her friends um, went on, uh, they went, packed up their packed lunches in their minibus down to 
uh, the Grunwick factory. Now, if you don't know that, Google it. It's a really great story. And it's a great story as well about women sticking two fingers about their employer and changing the movement around them. And she didn't realise the profound impact that would have on her life. And I think that's one of the reasons she always then said, you join a trade union. Um, so my mum came, came to Britain twice, right? The first time she came here, she came um, post World War II to get a job, um, because what um, Theresa May and Priti Patel forget is that people that were black and minority and they were actually invited over to come and do the jobs that the people here didn't want to do. And she came over to do one of those jobs and saw it as this great life opportunity. So she was uh, born in post partition Pakistan and really didn't like the opportunities there, so came here. Um, she'd be sad for how this has turned out here, but you know, we tried to change it. But the political, the social, and the economical scars were really raw still there. So the opportunity to um, change things for the better was undeniable. Now, there was a separate story of how my mum was too young and potentially stole the paperwork to get here. But I'm still figuring that one out. And can you edit that? Because if Pretty does find out, <laughs> my passport's going to be So, um, but she'd only planned to come over for a little while, make enough money, go back, you know, support her family, and lots of immigrant stories start like that. But someone really should have told her that's not how they end up when you get here. Life doesn't work that way, especially if you have a plan. So, but what she did talk about those first few years here were the loneliness, the long work days, the awful, awful weather, which she just couldn't get her head around, um, really crappy housing conditions, and really bland food, really, really bland food. Um, she would talk about casual racism, casual sexism. She would talk about casual racist abuse, casual sexist abuse, like it was just part of the course. But because she was a woman, I think the phrase goes, nevertheless, she persisted. And um, she built life here, and a big part of her body of life here was finding solidarity in a group of women that supported each other. So they shared childcare burdens, they made care packages for each other, they learned up recipes so that food tasted better. You know, they knitted, they did all those things to enjoy and found that they were building networks that built a life. Um, my dad came along, they got married, and my mum went back home um, just to see her family and um, I think to finally put to bed the idea of going back home before she moved back. My dad, or my mum, um, I'm not sure who, they decided to buy a house. But the problem with that was when they went back to Pakistan, they didn't have enough money to get back here. They bought one-way ticket, you know. And I don't really know how it worked in those days, but this is what happened. So my dad thought it was perfectly, perfectly reasonable to undertake a 4,500 mile journey with a heavily pregnant wife, which was my mum, pregnant with my brother, in a clapped out, sick green, gas guzzling, noisy box wagon van, right? Um, so they drove 4,500 miles from Pakistan via Afghanistan across the Caspian Sea. Um, they did a whistle stop for, tour through bits of the former Soviet Union across Europe, over a really choppy channel, which to this day my dad won't get on the ferry, absolutely will not, and landed in Derby. And that van had no heating, right, and no air conditioning, and the windows didn't stay up, and uh, they couldn't be wound down either. It was the worst of all scenarios, because my dad said the handle didn't come with the van. Nobody wants to know where he got from. And my mum, who was heavily pregnant, she often told me, you know, how the springs poked out the seats and how the only entertainment for thousands of those miles was either the various local language radio stations that the van radio would pick up or Led Zeppelin III, which she would never, even, never, the thought of it would make her green in the face after that. And that was because 
It was really important that those values that she had built up around collectivism and unionism and being together and building something were values that she wanted her children to be born into. So whilst it is really crappy for women, I really think we ought not underestimate women because they will travel 4,500 miles pregnant in a van, campaign endlessly for their children, and nobody else has that steel determination. Thank you. Thank you so much. I was invited to talk about um, women that have shaped history and women that have shaped our movement. And I think those two things are connected together. And I think it's really important to recognise that women have such an important role to play in our movement, but that there are so many barriers to fulfil women's participation. So it's really um, exciting for me to be in a space where we can talk about the journey so far, but also what now needs to happen to really... Um, make the ground fertile for the next generation of women coming forward but also smash down the structures that are holding women back so that we've got a more diverse more equal movement which is championing a more diverse more equal workforce I'm from Wigan National Education Union and I saw it advertised through the Northwest Regional Pensioners Association recently I read a book which was more of a novel about the situation at Bryant and May match so I wanted to know more about that but also I'm representing our equalities officer so I came with a open mind. The speakers have been fantastic and I really hope that this event continues in the future. Uh, so today is the inaugural uh, GMATUC President's Conference so uh, what that means is uh, each year we'll be uh, showcasing an important part of um, how trades councils work, how they work with trade unions and how they work with people in the community and, and what we can do together. And the focus for this one has been on women, uh, particularly women who uh, have shaped the trade union movement and women who have shaped uh, movements around social justice. So we've had uh, speakers who've talked about um, their experience personally in the trade union movement, their experience in things like welfare rights and uh, and helping people have access to the things that they need to live. Um, we've got speakers coming up who are talking about uh, their work around the criminal justice system and uh, tackling the discrimination and the prejudices that exist within that and how that affects families. Um, so our hope is that today has been uh, sort of an introduction really of a way of looking at uh, these kind of hidden stories, the number of women who you know, didn't necessarily know they were leaders, didn't set out to be leaders, but who saw a need, uh, started working towards it, and then brought others along with them. And it turned out that there, you know, there's always so much to do in these uh, situations, but that just makes it possible for so many more people to get involved. It might, you know, you might not know how to start, or you might not know uh, you know all of the technical jargon and those kind of things but if you have a passion to uh, solve an injustice if you have a passion to bring people together for uh, to ensure they've got better health and safety to ensure that they um, have dignity and respect at work if you uh, have a passion to to change something really locally then uh, you know history proves that women can and do do it all the time and uh, and the county association is really excited about supporting any Greater Manchester women who, uh, who, you know, want to change the world starting here.